Okay, so shall we start? Sure. Yes. Okay. So for our second talk today, we are very happy to have, have, have Javier Magan, who will be telling us about the entropic order parameters for phases of QFT. Okay, so thank you, Juan. And thanks uh, to all the organizers for the opportunity to speak at this meeting. So today I'm going to describe a, a recent work done in, collab in collaboration with Horacio Cassini, Marina Huerta, and Diego Pontello. And in few words, it deals with the interplay between um, symmetries and information theory in the context of quantum field theory. So let me, let me start with the motivations. So concerning agile flows, we want to deepen our understanding of this uh, formula here that uh, presumably relates the entanglement entropy of a ball or radius R in a conformal field theory to the um, A anomaly in even dimensions and the partition function on the Euclidean sphere in all dimensions. So I said presumably because uh, there are subtleties that uh, appear in quantum field theories with um, symmetries, uh, whether global or gates. And indeed, there are uh, concerns about the um, assumed uh, universal nature of these parameters. The main reasons are that, uh, well, the by now famous ambiguities that appear in lattice definitions of entanglement entropy. And one of the main um, motivations for our work is, uh, was to clarify these issues and to find ways to, to obtain results that do not depend on these ambiguities. An important question that, uh, uh, that also motivates uh, much of our work is uh, uh, ask for the ambiguities that do survive the continuum limit uh, and are not an artifact of the, of the lattice. Another important motivation concerns uh, the um, Ryu Takayanagi prescription to compute entanglement entropy in holographic field theories. And in this context, uh, we are seeking uh, to find a non, a non replica trick proof of the prescription. And with this objective in mind, uh, we believe that uh, understanding the interplay between symmetries and, um, and information theory in QFT is an important first step in order to understand entanglement entropy in gravity and in holography. And lastly, we are uh, motivated to push forward our, uh, our understanding of symmetries in, in QFT. So uh, typically, uh, uh, symmetries in QFT are defined uh, based on a, on a Lagrangian formulation. And uh, this definition is thus, is, is thus confined to weak coupling regimes. Now, um, leaving aside uh, space-time symmetries, uh, there are two important uh, exceptions to, to this law. One is the DHR uh, approach to global symmetries in the context of algebraic quantum field theory. And the, um, the other is the, the more recent one uh, approach to generalize global symmetries. Uh, in, this, in this context, we were, motivate, we were motivated to find a, a unified perspective that uh, was able to add up the advantages of, of each approach and uh, eliminate um, the disadvantages. So, um, let me now describe the, with this objective in, with motivations in mind, let me now describe the plan of the talk. So first we are going to describe uh, what are the properties that appear when we associate uh, algebras to uh, space-time regions, but uh, we will do this in, directly in the continuum quantum field theory. Then we want to uh, uh, describe uh, gauge theories and generalize symmetries uh, from this perspective. And uh, in the last part, we will, we will go to the core of the talk where we will define entropic order parameters that uh, we'll, we'll, we will define and analyze uh, entropic order parameters uh, uh, that are able to capture all these symmetries. And we will see what, what they teach us um, uh, in the characterization of, of phases in quantum field theory. So let me start by describing the, the properties that appear when we assign algebras uh, to space-time regions in, in the continuum quantum field theory. So the first property uh, is isotonia. It says that uh, if we have a region R1 included in a region R2, then the algebra we associate to R1 should be included in the algebra we associate to R2. This is pretty trivial. The next one uh, is additivity. Uh, intuitively, this tells us how to build uh, algebras for large space-time regions out of algebras of uh, small space-time regions. For, the, for this specific uh, case, for example, it tells us that the 
what we will call uh, the local algebra of the union or the additive algebra of the union is just defined to be uh, the tensor product of the algebras in each of the regions. The third property is uh, microcausality. So in the operator approach to quantum field theory, it says uh, that uh, any operator that belongs to certain region R commutes with any operator that belongs to the uh, complementary region. Uh, where the complementary region is defined as the set of points that are space-like separated from the, from the original region. Now, in the algebraic approach, this uh, microcausality um, is nicely expressed through this um, inclusion of algebras here, which just says that the algebra we associate to R must be included in the algebra, uh, in the commutant of the algebra we associate to, uh, to the complementary region. Now the question, uh, the, the final property arises when we ask whether this inclusion is saturated or not. Now uh, this saturation might be, might be a natural property to expect for uh, sufficiently complete theories. And uh, by convention, we will, we will call it, uh, it is usually called hack duality or uh, duality for short. Now the real question is whether uh, violating this, this duality is pathological or not in quantum field theory. Or in other words, uh, what happens if duality is not satisfied for a certain region R? So what it is clear if, it is, if, if duality is violated is that we have uh, two natural algebras associated to the same region. We have uh, the usual uh, local algebra, uh, this A of R here, but we also have what can be called the, the maximal algebra consistent with causality. This is just defined to be the commutant of the algebra uh, in the complementary region. Now, of course, this maximal algebra contains the local algebra, but to be different from it, it also contains uh, some non-locally generated operators that we will denote uh, by A. Here. Now, uh, interestingly, the violation of duality in a region R forces a, a dual uh, breaking of duality in the complementary region. The reason is simple and is because uh, we can take uh, two different commutants. So we can take the commutant of the local algebra in R or we can take the commutant of the maximal algebra in R. And therefore uh, for, the, for the complementary region, we have the same thing. We have uh, the local algebra and we also have the maximal algebra which contains the local one but it also contains some non-locally generated operators that we will denote by B. Now, uh, after a couple of thoughts, uh, 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 one, uh, easily uh, one is convinced that these operators uh, cannot commute between each other and they are thus uh, complementary from the point of view of quantum mechanics. Finally, um, in, this, uh, in these scenarios in which we have a generic uh, violation of duality, we can define um, generalized sectors or uh, if you wish generalized uh, classes A and B, one uh, per region that uh, are just defined by taking the quotient of the maximal algebra with respect to the local algebra. And uh, uh, one can see that this, these classes or these uh, sectors define a natural notion of fusion that needs to be analyzed on a case by case basis. So uh, with this preliminaries, we are ready to state our, our main proposal. So uh, the proposal is that uh, not only the violation of duality is not pathological in quantum field theory, but it is also at the origin of symmetries in, in QFT. So in particular, uh, theories with global symmetries can be defined as those displaying violation of duality in regions with non-trivial uh, pi zero, and uh, this forces a violation of duality in a region with non-trivial pi d minus two, where these pi's uh, are the usual uh, homotopy groups of the region. So this pi zero, for example, would be a disconnected region, uh, non-trivial pi zero. Uh, also, for gauge theories uh, with physical symmetries, uh, this, this, uh, we can define them as those that, that display violation of duality in regions with non-trivial pi 1 and non-trivial uh, pi d minus 3. And more generally, uh, we can uh, just define theories with generalized symmetries as those displaying violation of duality in regions with non-trivial pi i and pi d minus 2 minus i. Now, let me remark that uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, proposal, it is um, 
it is a it, it, it is local in a space, so it can be it can be uh, phrased in a in a in a ball of certain radius, and uh, also it it doesn't require um, complicated back backgrounds. It just applies to uh, quantum field theory in Minkowski space. So sorry to interrupt, but instead yeah. of game theories, do you mean uh, theories with one form symmetry, or do you? Yeah, well, we are going to arrive to that. Thank you for the question. Uh, with gauge theories, I mean, um, with with gauge theories with physical symmetries, I would say, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Let me say for the moment, uh, it, it's gauge theories with one form symmetries. Yes. It, so, for us, uh, the the point here is uh, whether we can define what a gauge theory is from a mass, from an abstract perspective. Um, if we can give some, some, somehow uh, some sort of definition. Of course, you would say, well, a gauge theory is anything that has a gauge symmetry, but uh, when we quote it by the gauge symmetry, uh, what we are left with is just uh, a bunch of algebras in regions. And we, we would like to give some, some sort of uh, an ambiguous definition of what a gauge theory is. And uh, this, this goes very much in the, it's basically, it's basically the same as the as the approach uh, based on one form symmetries. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes. So, are, are you uh, considering the possibility that additivity is also violated? I would I would have said, for example, in Maxwell theory, that additivity is violated if the regions aren't contractible. Uh, yes. Um, so, additivity. I mean. I would take the perspective that additivity is just a definition of what you mean by, by so for example, here, uh, uh, so um, this is called, this A of R here is the additive algebra or the local algebra. In that sense, it is, it is just a definition of what, of how you construct an algebra in a ring. But I don't, okay. I don't think that that's the, that's consistent with what we usually mean, right? Like, if, so for example, in Maxwell theory, so I can have a tube, a tube region, right? Like, uh, and then I would say a Wilson line that lives in that tube is part of the algebra, but okay. that definitely doesn't is not consistent with additivity because I can cut the tube into two pieces. And in free Maxwell theory, there's no way to generate that Wilson yeah, line from the pieces of the tubes, right? You're right. You're right. So what you say is that uh, yeah, I'm going to arrive to that. Uh, but what you are saying is that uh, if you are talking about the maximal algebra, and the maximal algebra is not additive. The maximal algebra is the local one, the additive part plus these non-local Wilson loops that you are describing. Uh, but then I think, I think most of us, I mean, I understand that these algebraic field theory people don't understand gauge theory, but I think most of us would say that this A max is what should really be called the algebra then, right? Because this, certainly if you have a Wilson loop in a region, I think we say it should be an operator in that region. Even if okay. the region is okay. not contractible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I would agree with that, but uh, I, I can just define this. Uh, it, it is convenient to define these two natural algebras. One is okay, the maximum. So maybe, but maybe we should remember for the non-experts that A max is what most of us mean by the algebra. Exactly. Yeah, OK. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah, Thank A max you. would be the, 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 the natural algebra, yeah, including the Wilson loops. We are going to, to see examples. I also have a question here. Are you going to give us a precise definition of uh, what it means to have a gate symmetry and to identify the gate symmetry of the system based on the abstract presentation of the theory, or is this yes. enough to ask? Yes, exactly. Uh, so this, so uh, the, the the abstract definition would be this one here. So I would define a gate theory as a as a as a quantum field theory that violates uh, duality or additivity in a region with non-trivial uh, pi one. So in a in a, in a ring-like region. So you would say electrodynamics, electrodynamics with dynamical charges is not a gauge theory by this definition. From this perspective, from this perspective, it is not. And you want get in free, you want gauge theory in three dimensions. Is it a gauge theory or not? It it is a gauge theory. Well, Even in three dimensions, sorry, sorry, one, one moment. Let me so ask you differently. A compact scalar in two plus one dimensions, is it a gauge theory or not? Well, uh, let me say that in, in three dimensions, uh, this is explained in the article is very subtle because uh, in three dimensions, the definition of, of what is a global symmetry and what is a gauge, theory, a gauge symmetry, uh, from our perspective, it, it mixes. And, and, and some, subtle, some subtleties appear that need to be disentangled. So um, uh, yes, um, it is from the point, from the present point of view, it is not clear uh, that there is a difference between a, a gauge theory in three dimensions and a theory with global symmetries. So more assumptions than, than, than these ones uh, expressed here need to be, need to be uh, assumed to distinguish between both. 
I see. Wouldn't you expect that you shouldn't be able to distinguish between both because of this? No, I, I'm just saying. So, so, what, so I'm just saying that if you look to the proposal and it, and if you fix d equal to three, then uh, the definition of gauge theories violates pi one and pi zero, and the definition of global symmetries violate pi zero and pi one also. So, from I mean, just from this definition, uh, uh, it is not enough to distinguish um, gauge a uh, gauge theory. In three, in three dimensions from a theory with a global symmetry in three dimensions. Right, but but we expect like a plus for these definitions. It sounds like it's a good feature of these definitions because- It, it, is, like, it, is, probably, it is probably a good feature, uh, but uh, there, are also, uh, there are also disadvantages. Um, uh, yeah, this is something we need, we need to, uh, to understand better. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, for for concreteness, uh, we are going um, maybe because it's the, the more interesting case. Um, or, uh, we are going to for this talk, we are just going to focus on on gauge theories. And for gauge theories, uh, the proposal instructs us to consider a region R which has non-trivial pi one. So this means it is topologically a ring. Then these forces, uh, I mean, the, uh, uh, that the region R prime has non-trivial pi d minus three, which in four dimensions is, a, is again a ring, uh, which is the, the figure I have depicted, I have depicted here. Now, uh, as mentioned before, what we are just going to assume uh, is, a, is a generic uh, violation of duality, which means that uh, we have two natural algebras uh, that we can define for, region, for both regions R and R prime. One is the natural, the, the local algebras or the additive algebras, this A of R and A of R prime, but also we have the maximal algebras, which include the non-locally generated operators. Now, an important uh, uh, distinction, um, uh, distinctive, distinctive feature, feature of, uh, of, of gates and generalized symmetries is that the proposal uh, says that the regions R and R prime are simply connected. And this has a, an, interesting, an, an interesting implication, and is the following. So consider a loop, uh, a non-local loop of class A, this one depicted in the left part of the figure. And the implication is that uh, we can convert this non-local operator of class A into two non-local operators of class A just by doing local operations in the gray region. So um, for, gaze, for generic gauge theories in generic dimensions, we have uh, proven this in the article by explicit uh, construction of the of this uh, local splitting operation, but for the present talk, uh, let me just uh, there is a more uh, direct argument, and it, it works as follows. Uh, it just says it just notices that there is no way to distinguish this uh, this uh, scenario from this other uh, scenario by uh, doing uh, dual uh, measurements of dual uh, non-local operators in this uh, in these rings. So since since uh, those uh, dual rings uh, cannot distinguish uh, these two scenarios, they have to be the same from the point of view of the, of the non-local classes we defined before. So uh, this maybe uh, abstract implication has another, um, has a, a more concrete uh, implication, a, a, a more concrete result, uh, is, uh, that was proven first uh, in the article of 2015. And it says that the fusion of, uh, by different means, in the article of 2015, by different means, and is that the fusion of classes associated to generalized symmetries corresponds to an abelian symmetry group. So the point is that the, the, the origin of the abelianity in our approach uh, is very different. And in particular, it does not require to, uh, we, uh, to go to the Euclidean formulation. And it, uh, the reason is, is, is basically as follows. We, we just play the same game we played before, but inside the ring. So uh, we consider this uh, locally generated loop of class A but we depicted in the left part of the figure, but we now elongate it by doing local operations all over the ring until the extremes uh, touch each other. And then we do the local operation, we, 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 prove, we just prove, uh, proven the, its existence. And then we convert uh, this, uh, this locally generated operator of class A into two non-local uh, operat uh, non operators of class A and the conjugate A. What this means is that the product of A and A bar is locally generated inside the ring. Or uh, if you want to think in the fusion rules, uh, it means this equation here. So it means that the, the fusion of the of certain class with the conjugate class, it has to provide uh, the, the identity class uh, by um, uh, yeah, mandat uh, in a mandatory way. 
So uh, this, of course, uh, for the people that are um, use uh, uh, that are uh, familiarized with uh, fission rules, it corresponds to an abelian symmetry group. And uh, the way to prove it is just by assuming the generic fission rules and multiply the fission rules by the conjugate uh, class in the left. So um, moreover, uh, and this is important, uh, I, I'm not going to, to go over it, but uh, in the article, we proved that uh, not only the fission of classes corresponds to an abelian group, but uh, one can construct uh, actual operators, A's and B's in the complementary regions uh, representing the dual abelian groups. This is important because uh, with these actual operators, uh, we can now study the action of the B's on the A's or, 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 vice, versa, or vice versa. So for example, if we want to study the action of the B's on the A's, uh, it is convenient to uh, define the following maps or let me call them better uh, projections that, uh, uh, that are constructed by using the operator representatives of the B's uh, symmetry group and they are labeled by the um, irredu irreducible representations of the B's symmetry group. And these are the characters. So there is one per, per irreducible representation. And I, I'm going to state just uh, their properties without proof. So uh, these maps, um, uh, the, proof are, uh, the proofs are in the article. So these maps are uh, maps from the maximal algebra in R, which I remind it includes the local algebra in R plus the non-locally generated operators. Uh, they, they, uh, it maps this maximal algebra uh, to itself. Then if we apply it two times, um, it, it provides uh, themselves or zero. So this is the, the thing expected for a projection. If, uh, if a certain projection for certain representation when, applied to cert, uh, when we apply it to certain class, uh, the result belongs to that class. And uh, if the result is non-zero, then uh, for certain class A and certain irreducible representation R, then the result for any other irreducible representation will be zero. So this is, uh, uh, this is also expected for a projection. But it is important here because uh, this means that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, irredu irreducible representations of the B symmetry group with the uh, elements of the A symmetry group, so with the A's. And therefore, we can, do, we can thus uh, label the representations of the B's uh, with the A's. Uh, so having defined this map, what is in, uh, interesting to do, it is apply them for, a, for the operator representatives of the A's symmetry group themselves. And we arrive at this um, apparently uh, trivial and redundant uh, expression here, but that when we multiply it by, the, by B in both sides, we finally arrive to, to this equation here, which we recognize as the, um, as the usual commutation relations between order and disorder parameters in uh, gauge theories or theories with generalized symmetries. But uh, let me remark that uh, here we have not assumed this equation as a definition of, a, of an order or disorder parameter or, or, or as a relation between them. We have just derived uh, this relation uh, from, the, from just assuming a violation of duality. Also, uh, as usual, uh, uh, the generalized Dirac quantization condition arises here just by um, enforcing causality in these in this quantum field theories that violate duality. So since the discussion has been uh, uh, very brief uh, and abstract, uh, I apologize for that. Uh, let me summarize the logic. So we have started just by assuming a generic uh, violation of duality in a ring-like region. And we have shown that this uh, first implies a violation of duality in the complementary region. And then it implies the existence of dual abelian symmetry groups uh, with fixed algebra between themselves. Such algebra can be interpreted by saying that the A's form a symmetry group and the B's are charged with respect to it or vice versa. So uh, as an example, and, and this maybe will answer uh, better um, uh, Daniel, Daniel's question, um, Let's consider non-abelian gauge theories. So in these theories, uh, the full algebra of the theory is uh, generated by Wilson and top loops, which uh, are the obvious candidates to violate duality in regions with non-trivial pi one and non-trivial pi d minus three uh, respectively. So let's start with the Wilson loops. So as we all know, Wilson loops are um, uh, labeled by irreducible representations of the, of the gauge group. But uh, uh, they, of course, do not generate an abelian symmetry group. So what is happening? 
So the question we need to ask is if all Wilson loops uh, violate duality or not. And uh, to guide us through this question, we have to remember that the fundamental times the anti-fundamental uh, in an abstract way uh, we expect should not violate duality because we just prove it. This means that in this case, we expect that the Wilson loop in the adjoint representation should not violate duality. But this is, uh, this is of course the case because the Wilson, law, the Wilson loop in the adjoint representation can be broken into pieces, uh, into, into Wilson lines of the adjoint representation because uh, gluons are charged uh, themselves. So from our perspective, the, uh, uh, the, the Wilson loops in the adjoint uh, belong to the, to the additive algebra, belong to the local algebra. And the, truly set, the true set of non-local Wilson loops is given by the quotient of all Wilson loops by those generated uh, by arbitrary fusion of the adjoint. In the mathematical uh, literature, uh, this is called the universal grading uh, of the fusion algebra. And uh, for Lie groups, it can be uh, uh, shown that uh, it is isomorphic to the quotient between the, the weight lattice and the root lattice. So um, we conclude that the non-local Wilson loops run, the truly non-local Wilson loops from this uh, 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 duality perspective, run over representations of the center of the gauge group, and they are uh, then the dual operators to the top loops as originally defined by, by top. And a, 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 similar, a similar analysis works uh, for top loops. So um, uh, if, if there are no questions, I'm going to move to the, to the, to the last part of the talk. Um, so we have seen that- I have a question. It seems yeah. to me that what you defined is precisely the, the fact that there is a higher form symmetry rather than yes. the gauge symmetry. So if, if you replaced everything you said before as this is the diagnostic of the existence of a higher form symmetry, I think Daniel would not have given you a hard time. Then, sorry, can you repeat the last part? If you report, earlier you said that you have some diagnostic of gauge symmetries, but if you replace that sentence by saying that you have a diagnostic of a higher form symmetry, rather than saying a diagnostic of a gauge symmetry, then I think Daniel would not have given you a hard time. Ah, okay, thank you. But, yeah, you, you, you are total, yeah, you, I agree, I agree. Uh, I mean, from that perspective, I, I think that there is no di diagnostic of a gauge symmetry because it doesn't really exist in the in the quantum field theory. Perfect. But, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So, um, so we have seen that uh, that symmetries imply a violation of duality in certain regions or uh, uh, vice versa. So uh, this implies that there is an ambiguity in the choice of algebras uh, for these regions. So we have uh, the local algebra, A of R, which, uh, but the important thing to notice here is that this A of R, for example, in non-abelian gauge theories, includes some Wilson loops, includes all the Wilson loops in the fusion of the adjoint, for example. So it is, uh, this is the, the subtlety that uh, I think it's, in, it's interesting to, to notice. So uh, we have the, the local algebra uh, in the ring, uh, and we, but we have also the maximal algebras uh, that, are, uh, that contain the local ones, but also some non-locally generated operators. Now, these uh, A's and B's correspond to intertwiners and twists for global symmetries, uh, Wilson and top loops for gauge symmetries, and so on and so forth. But the, the question uh, I want to, to ask now is uh, what uh, order disorder parameters do we have at our disposal? So typically, um, the usual uh, operator approach in the usual operator approach, one considers expectation values of the uh, order disorder uh, algebra. But um, let me say that uh, uh, well, and, and of course, I study them in the in the state of interest. But from our point of view, this choice uh, does not seem to make transparent the deep relations between both sets of operators, as follows from the commutation relations and the uncertainty principle. Also, another, another uh, more mild uh, disadvantage is that it also depends to some extent in the explicit definition of the operators in quantum field theory, so the explicit smearing. Now, another choice, an another natural choice, maybe better from a need from qubit uh, perspective and that has not been explored, are the born Newman entropies of the non-locally uh, non generated algebras A's and B's. But uh, after uh, a couple of thoughts, uh, we find that uh, similar disadvantages appear, and we would like a choice that uh, is able to overcome these uh, these disadvantages. So to 
motivate um, our proposal, let me say that the the relation between duality violation and quantum complementarity can be nicely described by, by this diagram here. In this diagram, uh, in the corners of this diagram, uh, we have the different algebras that uh, come into play. So for example, in the upper left part, we have the, the maximal algebra in R, which uh, is the local algebra plus the non-local plus the A's. Going to the left, we project this algebra to the local part. And this projection is done, uh, is, a, is accomplished by a conditional expectation, which uh, for the time being, you just uh, can think about it as a generalization of uh, projections in Hilbert spaces to von Neumann algebras. Now, uh, going in the vertical direction means taking the commutant and, uh, for example, um, uh, the local algebra in R, when we take the commutant, uh, takes us to the local algebra in R prime plus the Bs. And going to the left, uh, we arrive to the local algebra, we project into the local algebra in R prime. So the nice thing of this, uh, we call this a complementarity diagram, and it suggests defining the following big uh, order parameters. So we have one entropic order, and we have one entropic disorder, uh, one, per, uh, one per region. These are, these are defined in terms of uh, relative entropies. Uh, which uh, are computed in the maximal algebras of the regions in question, and, uh, and they compute the difference between, um, between two states. One state is the, is the state of interest. It could be, for example, the vacuum. And the other state is uh, the same state, but in which we have integrated out the non-locally generated operators. And again, this integrating out uh, the non-locally generated operators is nice, nicely accomplished by this um, conditional expectations, which are uh, the generalization of projections to von Neumann algebras. Does so, it mean, what, oh, sorry, yes. does it mean concretely that in the state omega composed with epsilon, you simply set to zero the non-locally generated operators? Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, yes, the expectation values, yes. Okay, so omega composed with epsilon has the same expectation values for locally generated operators as omega, but it has exactly. zero for all the non-locally generated operators. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. It would, yeah. So uh, this, uh, this, uh, this order parameters uh, just depend on the, the, by construction, this order parameters just depend on the geometry and topology of the regions R and R prime, but uh, uh, they do so while still being functionals of the statistics of the non-local operators. So this- uh, Javier, I have, can I ask a question? Yes. So I'm a little bit confused about the commutants that you wrote. So I thought that if you talk about the A maxes, then they actually do obey duality. Is that wrong? It, it, it is wrong, yeah. It's no, wrong? It, so no, 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 it is not wrong. It is not, uh, it is, um, let me say what the- I, uh, I thought the commutant should go diagonally in between those upper left and lower right. No, because... no, it cannot go, it cannot go diagonally. It, it goes, it goes in this direction. Because the A's that, uh, do not uh, do not commute with the B's. So maybe I have the wrong pictures of the A's and the B's. I, I thought that the A's were the Wilson loops, with both the Wilson and the Atuf loops in the region R, and the B's were the both the Wilson and Atuf loops in the region R prime. Is that wrong? That that would be in four dimensions. Yes, we are going to describe. Yes, yeah, so say so say in four. Yeah, say in four dimensions. In four dimensions. Um, yes, that is that the, is. Possible. But then I thought that I thought that the the Wilson all the Wilson and Atuf lines in region R commute with the Wilson and Atuf lines in region R prime because they're space like separated. Isn't that right? No, no, it's not right because the Wilson loops that do uh, do not commute with the top loops. Even sorry, if, they if are they're sorry, if they, at space like separation they do if they're correctly quantized. No, no, but they but they are linked with each other. So it doesn't matter; they still commute as long as they're space like separated. And you're hearing a setup in which it's allowed. To consider larger collections of operators where they don't commute, and then oh, are you you're allowing improperly quantized Wilson lines in the top? I think the paper, picture is too complicated to be expressed in this short talk, but mm -hmm. what you heard about ten minutes ago was a description of properly quantizing them. Um. Well, okay, maybe I don't want to push too much on it, but I, I, I certainly would have said that the commutant of the of the A max includes the Wilson loops and Etuf loops in the in the complementary region. No, no, but but it it, it does not. It it, does, it certainly does not. Uh, yeah, well, maybe so we, we must mean different things by Etuf Wilson line and Etuf lines, but maybe I shouldn't get into it then. We can we can discuss later if you want. 
Um, so, um, but the, but for us, the, the true uh, advantage of, of this choice is that uh, a certain relation can be proven between the, the dual and tropic order parameters. So in particular, the sum, this is a very simple relation, the sum of both of them is equal to the logarithm of, of some number. This number is independent of the state omega. So, and this is the, the here lies the power of the relation. And, uh, and this number is called the algebraic index of the conditional expectation, which uh, has been very much studied in the mathematical uh, literature since the work of, of Jones. But uh, we are not going to, to, to go over the definition uh, today since it, in, it involves uh, several technicalities. But uh, let me say that for the cases of interest here, uh, for symmetry groups, it just equals the number of group elements. So um, as an intuition for this relation here, this certainty relation, uh, you think about it a generalization to non-commuting algebras of the famous uh, statement that says that the entanglement entropy of commuting algebras in pure states uh, are equal. So, uh, but from our point of view, the, the, the important thing is that this certainty relation encodes aspects of quantum complementarity between the non-local operators, between the Wilson and top loops, for example, as we are going to see in a moment. And moreover, it quantitatively relates uh, the statistics of order and disorder parameters. So, for example, uh, we can apply uh, this uh, to gauge theories uh, for the moment in, 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 in not in four dimensions. Um, uh, we can apply this to gauge theories and obtain several interesting exact relations. So for example, we can consider this complementarity diagram. Here we have in the upper left part, we have the local algebra plus the, uh, the Wilson loop in the ring. Going to the right kills the Wilson loop. Uh, the Wilson loops. Uh, taking the commutant, we find the local algebra in R prime plus the top loops. And going to the left kills the top loops. And uh, here, the, when we apply the, the certainty relation, the, it provides a, det a detailed balance between the statistics uh, of uh, Wilson and top loops. In particular, the sum of this uh, entropic uh, order and disorder uh, provides the logarithm of the uh, number of group elements of the center of the gauge group. Now, in four dimensions, um, top loops are also loop real loop operators, so real lines, and we can uh, include also uh, top loops in the in the ring, and also as a, we can include both Wilson and top loops in the ring R and in the ring R prime, and then we get this complementarity diagram uh, with uh, an associated certainty relation that provides twice the previous result. We can do even a little bit better. If we uh, in 4D, if we assume conformal symmetry, and we choose rings that uh, preserve uh, most of the symmetries, the obvious symmetries, so, such as this ring here. So this ring uh, is characterized by one conformally invariant cross ratio eta, and the interesting observation is that uh, the dual region, so the outside the outside region, is also a ring R prime, and uh, but uh, we. Uh, in which uh, the conformal invariant cross ratio eta prime is just equal to one minus eta. So in this case, the both entropic order and disorder depend on one single uh, parameter, parameter, this, et, this eta, and the, and the certainty relation uh, expresses uh, a very nice symmetry of this, uh, of this order uh, parameter that is enough constraining uh, such that, I mean, that, uh, that allows us to, to obtain uh, and a specific uh, uh, relative entropy for uh, conformal gauge theories in, in four dimensions, which says that this relative entropy in a ring of eta uh, equal to one half, it's equal to the logarithm of the number of group elements. Let me say that, uh, that or, or, or group elements of the center of the gauge group. Let me say that uh, all, these, all the relations that I have just described are, are valid at all couplings. Uh, and uh, in principle, uh, presumably they are, um, computable at weak coupling uh, and in, in holography. So that would be interesting, uh, an interesting thing to, to do. So um, until now we have uh, described uh, exact relations between entropic order and entropic disorder parameters, but uh, let me now describe how do we actually compute uh, uh, these, uh, these functions independently. So for concreteness, uh, uh, let me consider the entropic order, uh, the other is the same. So First, we notice that, well, let me say that the computation is, the exact computation, uh, it's very challenging of this relative entropy, but uh, we have found a two-step process that allows to find very, very, very tight results. 
So first we notice that um, lower bounds uh, can be obtained using monotonicity of relative entropy. So uh, this relative entropy is computed in the maximal algebra, but uh, we can find a lower bound by choosing an arbitrary choice of non-locally generated operators of non-local algebra and computed the relative entropy there, which is more or less simple. Then uh, monotonicity ensures this is a lower bound. And uh, since this is a lower bound, in order to, to get the best lower bound, we need to maximize over the choice of non-local algebra. So this is the first step. Uh, of course, this uh, maximization, even if we achieve it, uh, it doesn't um, en ensure that, uh, uh, that we are approaching the real value. So for that, we need an upper bound. And the upper bound is provided by using the certainty relation and computing the entropic disorder parameter again in an optimal choice of non-local algebra. So this is a little bit complicated, but uh, we arrive to this uh, chain of inequalities. And if we are able to, um, to make the left-hand side approach the right-hand side by clever choices of non-local algebras, then we are sure uh, we computed well the, the, the middle part. So an example of, of, of this uh, two-step process uh, is given in this slide, where uh, we compute the entropic order parameter for um, uh, the one associated to Wilson loops for the free Maxwell field. And in the plot, uh, you can see uh, the black lines uh, correspond to upper, I mean, uh, to the upper bound, and the red lines correspond to the lower bound, and these are analytic. Um, uh, so we can see already at the analytic level that this two-step process provide uh, uh, very tight results. And also uh, we can see by looking at the specific scaling in the right limit here, that uh, this entropic order parameter uh, provides the, the expected uh, conformal scaling. Uh, so we get here a perimeter law. So uh, it, is, uh, it is characterized in this phase. So in the article we have, uh, we have considered other scenarios, other phases, uh, but let me, let me, of this two-step process, but let me now, um, uh, for the last uh, two slides, let me give, let me give um, uh, the heuristics that it seems we are getting. So when characterizing phases uh, with the usual uh, operator approach, uh, we typically observe uh, three phases. So I'm going to discuss this uh, for, uh, conform for uh, gauge theories in four dimensions but uh, it can be generalized. So we can find a conformal phase in which the Wilson and top loops uh, display perimeter loss. We can find a Higgs phase in which uh, the, the, diso the disorder symmetry, uh, the symmetry associated to the disorder parameter, so the top loop is broken by a constant expectation value of the uh, order parameter. And we can find the, the dual phase, uh, the confinement phase, in which the order symmetry that is generated by the Wilson loops is broken by a constant expectation value of the top loops. Um, this follows as well uh, for any generalized symmetry in any dimension, just uh, modifying a little bit the, the scalings. And uh, let me say yes, uh, uh, that uh, since the entropic order and disorder parameters are functionals of the statistics of the, of the non-local operators, we can uh, obtain similar scalings for this uh, for this uh, entropic order parameters. But of course, this is not very surprising, and this does not uh, bring anything new to the game. What uh, what is new uh, is that uh, while in the operator approach, uh, the characterization of phases by means of uh, the or the order or disorder parameter is typically considered as independent, maybe dual to each other, but independent. Uh, the entropic approach uh, through, the th through the certainty relation uh, transparently shows that they are two phases of the same coin. So in particular, uh, we should be able to derive the area law from the constant law uh, and vice versa, for example. So at, the, at present, we do not have a rigorous uh, proof of this, but we have a non-trivial and uh, suggestive argument. So let me explain it. And with this, I will, I will, I will finish. So imagine we want to, to compute the entropic disorder parameter in, the, in this ring R prime, okay? So this entropic disorder parameter is, uh, is uh, this relative entropy computed in the maximal algebra of R prime, but uh, we can use the certainty relation to, uh, 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 and then monotonicity of relative entropy to relate or to put an upper bound uh, with a relative entropy computed in a subalgebra of the complementary region, so of R. 
So uh, we have this, um, and we can choose any any subalgebra that we that we want as long as it is included in the maximal algebra of the complementary region of R. Now, uh, the right choice is to choose uh, the algebra generated by many Wilson loops that all uh, of them cross the R link with R prime through the whole surface that is enclosed by the ring R prime. So we choose that as an, as a, as an algebra. And if we assume uh, no correlations, uh, and this is the this is the part in w uh, why the proof is not why why, th why this is not a proof, but um, uh, if we assume no correlations between the Wilson loops, then uh, if we are in a Higgs space and uh, and uh, we have constant expectation values for the Wilson loops, then we can prove that uh, the the entropic disorder parameter scaled uh, exponentially with the area and the, uh, or in other words, the expectation value of the top loop confines, let's say in, in, a, dual, in a dual formulation. So um, uh, with this, I, I, I want to end, just let me uh, summarize. So we have shown that, uh, or, uh, uh, that symmetries are related to hot duality violation, that different symmetries correspond to duality violation in regions with different topologies. Now, just from this assumption or from this observation, uh, the availability of generalized symmetries and the, uh, the, uh, the, the Dirac quantization condition and the commutation relations between dual um, ordinary disorder parameters are all determined by, by such violation. Now, something that I didn't, uh, I, 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 I could not explain in the interest of time was that uh, the usual, uh, uh, the standard confinement order parameters are necessarily those line or surface operators that violate duality. Then uh, uh, we, we saw that uh, this, uh, this uh, structure of the algebras um, suggests uh, canonical entropic order parameters uh, that can be unambiguously defined. They, don't do not, they are not uh, affected by this uh, lapis ambiguities and they capture uh, the physics of its generalized symmetry. And finally, the, the nice thing of choosing this, uh, these order parameters is that uh, the quantum complementarity that, that arises due to the commutation relations uh, can be nicely accounted by this entropic certainty relation, which uh, quantitatively relates the physics of order and disorder parameters. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. I have perhaps a background question. So you discussed uh, the, mainly the case of one form symmetries, if you mm -hmm. have ordinary symmetries, do, do you have a similar discussion or? Yes, yes, uh, in the article is, uh, is, is described, yes. Uh, but the, the only, the only um, so, well, sorry, one moment. I don't know why it doesn't go up now. Um, let me see here. Yeah, you said you had to be in this disconnected visions. Exactly. So this is, this is the proposal for, for ordinary symmetries, uh, where uh, we are going to have a violation of uh, duality in disconnected regions. And the reason is that, um, that um, we can construct this, uh, what, uh, what, uh, these intertwiners that are uh, uh, charge anti charge operators in each of the disconnected regions. These intertwiners uh, do not belong to the, um, to the, to the additive algebra because um, they are constructed by a charge operators in one region and a charge operator in the other region. And therefore, um, well, th these are the, 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 anal the, the analog of the non-local Wilson loops. The, this, this operator violate, violate duality. The only difference uh, that right. appears- is... Sorry, I mean, if we consider the algebra of all operators in a region, why, why couldn't I include the charge operators? Ah, because because here we are just considering the the, the algebra that uh, that is invariant under the symmetry group. Ah, okay. This is not the standard. Somehow. It is not the st in the case of global symmetries. It is not the standard. Yes. Ah, okay. So you have to do a different construction somehow. A little bit different, yes. Okay, and the right. important difference um, uh, is that uh, the argument that I did. Um, so here. Um, 
I said that for gates and general asymmetries, the regions are and are prime are simply connected, and this uh, this is um, this is key to the proof of the abelianity. So for for the usual uh, um, symmetries, uh, the regions are disconnected, and we don't we cannot prove the abelianity, and 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 indeed we we can have uh, more uh, generic fusion rules. Okay, thank you. Mark? Sure, just an, another basic question. I, I guess I, I was wondering, so if you have non-trivial topology of, of your, the space that your field theory lives on, uh, d does that give you something new sometimes or is, is most of the structure already captured just by considering these regions with, with different topologies? And uh, that's a good question. Uh, we, we haven't uh, uh, properly analyzed it. Um, I would say that that uh, in many situations this uh, this discussion is going to be uh, is going to be enough uh, the local discussion. But uh, but uh, it would be interesting to find uh, scenarios in which uh, uh, there is a structure beyond uh, the local one, and uh, we have not uh, analyzed this. Daniel? Yeah, so as, as Nadi commented, um, you know, if you, if you restrict to compact um, spatial manifolds, it seems like there isn't, you, you can talk about these one form symmetries or higher form symmetries, but it's hard to talk about gauge symmetries as meaning anything physical. Um, but I wanted to comment that if you consider spatial manifolds with boundary, then there's a sense in which gauge symmetry becomes more physical. For example, you can consider the electric flux through infinity in electrodynamics. And uh, that's an operator that acts non-trivially on the Hilbert space uh, and uh, gives you some kind of symmetry where um, the operators that transform under it are uh, half lines where you have a charged operator with the Wilson line going off to infinity. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess it maybe it seems that if you if you add boundaries to the story, then you have these additional kind of operators that end on boundaries. Um, uh, and I, I, would, I would say that to the extent that gauge symmetry is physical at all, that's kind of what we really mean are these asymptotic symmetries. Um, uh, and I, I would assume a similar story is possible, including you know, regions where part of the region contains a piece of, you know, where the region contains a piece of the boundary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for, for, from our point of view, um, so um, the physical part is this violation of duality in a ring. And of course, if you have a, a violation of duality in a ring, you can, um, you can consider uh, now breaking the ring and, uh, and um, connect, the, connect the, the two extremes to the boundary, to a certain boundary, as you say. And then uh, uh, we, we arrive to the, to the usual uh, conclusion because this would, uh, Provide a violation of duality in the boundary in two disconnected regions. So then uh, we see we see that uh, that um, yeah that in the boundary what would be a gauge a gauge symmetry in the bulk uh, uh, converts into a, a global symmetry. Well, we but the see. symmetry I'm talking about is true even if you, what you're saying doesn't happen, right? If we consider Maxwell theory with dynamical charges, for example. Um, so that uh, you, so that so that there's no one form symmetry. I guess technically I need dynamical magnetic charges too. But let's say both dynamical electric and magnetic charges. So there are no one form symmetries, but you still have this symmetry, which is generated by the electric flux and the magnetic flux at infinity. So there's some addition. So so there there's no violation of duality, um, or I would say no violation of additivity on compact manifolds, but there's still an interesting symmetry once you include an asymptotic boundary or even a finite boundary. Mm -hmm. I see. I would have to think uh, whether in that, uh, in that boundary uh, there is a, a violation of duality of certain uh, non-trivial um, regions, but- uh, Yeah, I didn't try to think about it that way, but maybe, but one presumably could. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Daniel, is there a distinction between asymptotic boundary or boundaries at infinity and, and finite boundaries. I mean, I guess in conformal field theories, it shouldn't matter maybe, but. Um, well, I, I guess the problem with, yeah, I guess maybe asymptotic boundaries are seem a little bit more 
constrained with with finite boundaries you can always get a little bit confused because you um you can think you found a new symmetry but actually all the things that are charged under it just live on the boundary and so then it's not clear that it's really a property of the the bulk theory um whereas with somehow with asymptotic boundaries it seems you're less likely to accidentally introduce new degrees of freedom mm. um and it also you know that also kind of makes it uh, with finite boundaries, you know, you can have some symmetry that seems physical, but actually because the theory is confining, there's not really any thing that you would measure in practice. Whereas by going to infinite volume, you can kind of make sure that the gauge symmetry you're talking about is deconfined and, mm -hmm. you know, has some real meat to it. If I have one minute, I, I can comment in the, in Dan, uh, about Daniel's talk uh, before. So, just consider the uh, in the during the talk. So um, if you just consider the free mass well field, you have the Wilson and top loops, okay, and then uh, uh, all Wilson loops violate duality, and all top loops violate duality. They are just the fluxes of magnetic and electric fields uh, through the surface, and they do not depend on the surface. Now uh, this uh, this uh, Wilson loop, uh, these Wilson loops, any of them, uh, do not commute with the top loops, any of them. Well, okay. I mean, I, I don't. I mean, I, I think. I think. I mean, I think. I understand what you're saying, which is just you're you're defining the commutant as the thing that commutes with all the local operators, which includes these what I would call improperly quantized Atif loops and Wilson loops, uh, which which I would say are really disk operators, not line operators. Um, but it's okay. I mean, it's okay to to take the algebra which is generated by the local operators to it these disk operators, and I, I mean, I think you're doing something interesting with it. So I don't. I don't want to say it's illegal. It's just not standard. Usually, we would say that only the Wilson lines, which are quantized integers, and only the Atif lines, whose charges are consistent with Dirac quantization, count as line operators. And all the other ones, we would say, are surface operators, and we wouldn't say they're part of the algebra in the tube. Oh, okay. Okay. That's that's the usual picture. So I mean, I understand maybe that you're doing yeah, something slightly yeah. different here. We we have a slightly different picture. Yes. And, and some subtleties appear. I mean, there are there are some uh, maybe uh, misleading uh, conclusions that one can get by by using uh, the picture you are you are you are you are discussing. But I think the one I said would obey duality. I, I mean, I, I think the the language yeah. is just different. But it, I mean, this is yeah, just really about choice. language, right? It's just a choice, uh, a Daniel. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you can consider what algebra you want. That's right. But I mean, I I, I believe that most people would say that you should include only the properly quantized lines. But that's, no, I agree, it's, it's a choice. You, you, I can't you stop you. Include, I, you have all those. You, you have, if you have the Maxwell field, you have all Wilson loops with all charges in the theory. I know, but most of them are surface. The, sorry, uh, Horacio, to be clear, most of those are surface operators, not line operators. And the issue becomes especially acute if you go to higher topologies, because then you can have loops that aren't contractible and you can't make them that way. No, no, only you, they are they are line operators, all of them. No, I disagree. Only, with only that. surface operator if you put charges. If you put I mean, to me, charges. the definition of a line operator is that if the two lines are at space like separated, the operators commute. I, I, I feel like that's. Yeah, the, I'm, not, I'm not willing to concede that point from a moral point of view. I'm happy to say that we can consider algebras that include some of these non local operators. That's fine. What, one important thing may, that maybe I have to stress is that in, in, this, uh, in this picture, you cannot choose the existence of an operator in the algebra or not. It exists in the, what I mean is it exists in the full algebra, all Wilson loops exist and all tough loops exist. Yes, I agree, I agree, I agree with that. In the, in the choice of the net, in the choice yeah, I agree. The, yeah, yeah, that's right. But to, so to me, this choice of the net is related to whether we say the gauge group is U1 or R. And so what you're describing, I would say is the net when the gauge group is R. Sorry, when the gauge group is R, I would say there are no tough lines and you have all the Wilson lines. In the case where it's U1, I would say that you have the quantized Wilson lines and the Dirac quantized Satoff lines but, as lines. But it's true that you have the disks, which can be quantized however you like. It's just most of them aren't line operators because they're the integral of a flux over a surface, right? That's how you represent them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are integral of the flux of the surface and they yeah, commute. So it's a surface operator. No, they don't commute no, with no, the they lines. Are not. <laughs> they don't commute with the lines that puncture this. I mean, I, this feels like a semantic discussion, so I'm not sure I want to. Uh, but I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't think I'm saying something too controversial here. 
I mean, I understand it's useful sometimes to take the, the standard algebra and add to it these things. No, that but live when, in you the say, region, when you but... say, for example, in the, in the simple case of the Maxwell field that you have a direct quantization and you have to solve it, all that, this solution is a choice. It's just a choice. I don't think, yeah, but I think whether the gauge group is U1 or R is a property of the theory. Wouldn't you agree but with in that? This case is R, right? In the, in uh, if it, so if good, if you want to say it's R, then I would say that all the Wilson lines are lines, but none of the Atuf lines are lines. They're all surfaces. Well, but, but why is that if it is completely, it's completely duality invariant the theory? No, no, no. It's, it's, it's a, it, because, because they don't commute. It's space-like separation with the Wilson lines. So if you want all the Wilson well, but lines you, you to you can lines, take all the, all the tough loops and, no, and, and none of the, of the Wilson loops. It's the same. Uh, it's just a choice. That's right. That, that's right. So that, that we could do, and that's R. That's also the R theory with the different gauge coupling. And you, and you can also take any solution of the Dirac quantization condition, maximal net. And, or it's and, also I, and I call that changing value. the radius of the... I mean, I, I'm sorry. I don't, I, don't, I'm, I don't know if this is interesting to most of the audience. I'm sorry for... for get, I mean, let's, why don't we discuss it over beer or something? Uh, or even better, over, over steak in, uh, in uh, Belice de Alberto. You know. Not, it, it, it has closed. It's no, closed. well permanently. Uh, no, we don't know. We don't know. Oh God, I hope not. Well, let me let me just let me just uh, uh, say that the, that the, there are there are interesting the uh, uh, confusions that arise from your perspective. Uh, I mean, it's not. It is true that this is uh, just semantic, but it, there, there is also some. Um, some uh, interesting aspects that come uh, when you consider it as we are considering. We, we have, we have I, I, I'm saying this because we have, a, 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 it's not that we find, a, a, we don't know what you are commenting. We have a, a struggle with, uh, with that. Um, with the terminology, with the terminology. With the terminology. It's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's inconvenient for, 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 for several things that are, that are important. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's complicated it's, uh, because it, it makes sense. Yeah, you somehow have to choose which principles you like. I like commutativity, it's based like separation, right? But I mean, this, yeah, I agree. Yeah, we, we, I, I, well, that, all the that, calculations can be done, whatever words you say. I agree with that. Well, but that only provides you with the idea of a net. The net is just a designation of algebra where space like separated commute, right? Hmm. This is a net. The, the important thing here is where, whether the net is unique or not. This is an important point. What well, given given enough principles that you impose, I think it is. No, it's, it's not because if you if you agree that the full operator content in in the full uh, space time is the same, you you already have different nets. You already have different nets, and you cannot eliminate these nets because you have all the operators there, and you can choose one or the other. Yeah, but I call that choosing the topology of the gauge group. Okay, and, you, and that okay. is a choice. But then you are, you are putting more structure than the theory has. The theory does not have this additional structure. Well, either. this is a question of what it means, what, what is meant by quantum field theory. To me, quantum field theory is something that makes sense on any background, including backgrounds with different topology. And therefore, we really have to choose the topology of the gauge group. Okay. Now, in RN, it's true that the only um, the only realization of that choice is in this choice of net. But I would just say the choice of net is part of the definition of a quantum field theory. You haven't defined you it until you say what the net is. So you're saying that if you put the theory in a, in a different manifold, you have to choose a net. Yes, that's correct. At 100%. Uh, that's, that's I didn't get it. Why is that? Why is that? Well, for example, because you can have topological degrees of freedom like holonomies and so on, right? So, so because once you have non-trivial loops, you can't, you can't make a loop on a non-contractible cycle by integrating a flux through a disk, right? Because there's no disk. So you now you have to decide whether that loop is there or not, okay? And that, and that changes the spectrum of the Hamiltonian of the theory quantized on a non-trivial spatial manifold. So since I think that, that the spectrum of the Hamiltonian on any spatial manifold should be specified by the definition of a quantum field theory, therefore we have to make this choice already on our end. This is how I think about it. But I, if you have a cylinder, for example, that why why is that the Maxwell field can have a some just kind think of about, just think about the torus, right? Just canonically the quantize torus. the Maxwell field on a torus. I, I'm sorry, yeah. I, I feel like I'm. I hope I'm not boring everyone here. I mean, this is fun for me. But um, if you quantize it on a torus, the spectrum of the Hamiltonian is different depending on whether the gauge group is R or U1, um, and it also depends on the radius of the U1. 
um, or in other words, it depends on the, on the gauge coupling. Um, I don't think you can avoid that, right? I mean, in, in particular, like if it's R, then the spectrum is continuous. So Whereas, by you, you are saying that you have all choices, but any choice will give you a different Hamiltonian. Yeah, on the torus, that's correct. And so if we want that to be unique, then we have to fix a net already on Rn if we want the nets to be compatible on Rn and on the torus. Yes, what, yeah, I agree with what Matt Hedrick just said in the talk also. I agree with what Matt just said in the chat. Yeah, in 2D, Matt, though, it's a little bit simpler because there even the set of local operators already shows you this because you have to decide whether you have the winding vertex operators or not. Um, in these higher dimensional examples, it's a little more subtle because you can agree, we can all agree on what all the local operators are, and yet we still have to have this discussion about what the net is because we have the surface operators. Yeah, I agree, but that's why it's clearer for me. Right, right, right. There, there it's clear already, yeah, that you just can't hide from it, yeah. Okay, but th then what you say is, that, no, but this is different because if you have a compact scalar, the, the, this radius, this radius uh, just defines a different theory, right? It's, yes, I know. I know Horacio was going to say that because for you, Horacio, yeah. the local operators yeah. define the theory. Yeah, right? it, so yeah, I, feel, I know where you're coming from. You are yeah. cho you're choosing different algebras. You are choosing subalgebras of one another. Yeah, because you think the you think the most important algebra is the one that's generated only by local operators. Okay. To me, the most natural operator is the job <laughs> is the algebra which is generated by the, all the operators in a region not just the local operators. No, what I mean is that if you change the competitivization radius, you change the, the algebra. You change the, the local and non-local, whatever, but you change the algebra. You are taking a sub-algebra of some other one that is with, with bigger radius, et cetera. So it's not the same thing. I mean, maybe so, it will help us. I'm not saying maybe a comment that'll help is if you take electrodynamics in, in higher dimensions on a torus and you dimensionally reduce, you end up with something like what Matt is saying. Yes, I, I don't, I don't uh, have any problem with that. <laughs> that so that, that's the, that's the relationship saying, between what Matt said and what I said. What I'm saying is that uh, if you have a compact scalar and you, you change the radius of compactification, you are changing the, the 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 algebras you are changing. Yeah, but I think you're. I think it's true if you change the gauge coupling too, and the gauge, and the, you know, or if you right, if you change, uh, if you, uh, if you, um, decide whether the gauge group is U one or R. I think it's exactly the same. You okay, the okay, algebras. okay, okay. The, but then you are you are you are not taking the Maxwell field. You are taking a subalgebra of the Maxwell field. You are so. It's important that- No, that no, no, this... oh, no, sorry, Arasio, to be very clear, all the operators that you talk about act on the full Hilbert space of the theory. They act as maps from Hilbert space to Hilbert space, which is the definition of an operator. Okay, all the Wilson lines and the Tuff lines for right. all quantizations act yeah. on the Hilbert space. The issue is what regions we associate the operators to, okay? Um, and so in the, in, on Rn, that's the only distinction between, so the Hilbert space, the spectrum, the Hamiltonian, everything is the same on Rn, whether the gauge group is U1 or R. The only difference is which operators we associate to which regions, which we call the choice of net, right? And, and I, I think the theory is just not defined until you say that. In, in, in Mikoski space, it's the same. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't change anything. It, it, the net changes, right? It's, it's a, it's, it, this yeah, comes yeah. into the definition of what you mean by quantum field theory. I agree that as a quantum mechanical system, right. it doesn't matter. All the operators yeah. are there. The spectrum of the Hamiltonian is the same no matter what. Yeah, yeah, but what I say is that if you, change, if you, if you choose a net, you can produce all the operators and you can then choose another net. So there is the, the important yeah, that, point. Right, but I call that diff choosing different theories. And the reason why it's choosing different theories is because then when you go to other manifolds, you get then you get a really different theory. Okay. Depending on which choice you made. And I think it's part of the definition of the quantum field theory is that you can study it on any background. Until you know the rules for doing that, you haven't defined a theory. And to see that you have to define the net.
which isn't to say that you can't take the net I like no, I and agree, nonetheless agree, study your algebra. The, you can. It's just it's not the I natural. I agree that algebra, the net but. is the, the quantum field theory is a net. Is a yeah. net. I agree with that, but I think the important point that we are discussing here where, is whether the net can be changed. Is is, is where, where the, whether there are more than one possible net for the same operator content. This I, is. A, this is the main so point. let's say for the same theory, I would say for the same theory, there's only one choice of net. If, if you know, it, assume, you know, it, that obeys the various properties that we like nets to obey. Um, and so if you, you can change it, but that's changing the theory. And it becomes clear when you go to another higher topology, like you put on the torus, and then you see it's just the Hamiltonian is different, you know, the Hilbert space is different. Mm. Sorry, I feel like I've got to the point where I'm repeating myself. So maybe I, Juan, do you want to <laughs> yeah. take control here? Um, I, I think we can continue that discussion in the coffee break and mm -hmm. we have to, to stop the recording and so on so that we can upload the, the recording. <laughs> okay, thanks again for the talk. And uh, I guess I see you, all of you in an, about an hour. Hmm. Same link for the coffee break as.